Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Greetings and welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? Tonight I'm going to be talking with Jenny Ashford and Steve Mira about their book, House of Fire and Whispers, investigating the Seattle Demon House, which is easily one of the most interesting uh, cases of poltergeist haunting type stuff I've ever read. It's it's really fascinating and I highly recommend the book. All three of Jenny's books on poltergeist have been excellent reads and uh, this is probably the best of the three. There will be a Patreon-only section uh, segment as well. I'll be uploading later in the week for patrons. And uh, I've just cleaned up our forums. So uh, I know we were promoting the forums for a while, and I realized at some point it wasn't sending me any messages uh, when people posted things as it was supposed to. So I went in and found a whole bunch of uh, weird spam. <laughs> and uh, I have no other, other way of putting it than that, weird spam from Poland. And I deleted all of those. They didn't seem to have much purpose behind them. I'm not really sure what, why they were there. But I cleaned up the forums. And, uh, yeah, so go talk to us in there if you want. There's a bunch of interesting stuff going on already. And uh, I'm going to try and keep on top of that a little bit better. There's also a group on Facebook for Where Did the Road Go if you want to become a part of that. And, uh, yeah, you can become a patron for the show. For just $3 a month, you get some extra content, you get stuff early, you get full interviews, and uh, we're going to be doing regular uh, Ask Us Anything type of shows that only the patrons are going to get. They won't be like interview shows or anything. You get to throw out some topics to us or questions to us, and uh, we will answer and post that. All right. Uh, we did our first movie review show up this week so if you missed that go check it out i'm going to have some of those in the future we got a pretty good response so i'm assuming you guys want more and i'm going to be having a bunch of different uh guests on that to talk about different movies but for now let's get into this one tonight jenny ashford steve mira house of fire and whispers well welcome back to the show jenny and welcome to the show for the first time steve mr thank steve, you very much mr thank steve mira Yes, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to uh, to be on the show. And uh, you two have co-written a couple of books now. The yeah, new- that's right. And want to tell people the title of the newest one? The new one is called House of Fire and Whispers, Investigating the Seattle Demon House. It's about the Keith Linder case. And this came out when? Just a, uh, gosh, it was just a few months ago, maybe five or six months ago. Oh. Yeah, about five, six months ago. Yeah. Now I just published the audiobook version, but the the print version and ebook version have been out for a few months. Okay, uh, Steve, you want to go into a, uh, tell people a little bit about who you are and what your background is? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, Thirty three years ago, I started in the subject. Nineteen eighty three, my first investigation was in Liverpool in the UK, and since then I joined a number of organisations and establishments and kind of worked through. Uh, into committee stage and, uh, and training, education. Um, and then I kind of got uh, more involved in the paranormal when I took on an investigation many years ago for the Ministry of Defence uh, in one of their buildings. They, they were having some disturbances take place, and it was a managerial problem. It was the public relations office, of, uh, office that contacted me to assist them. They reported paranormal disturbances and of course it became a management problem because staff didn't want to work there late at night and they called me in on a confidential basis along with 36 other investigators under me which all all had to po- <laughs> we all had to pose as electrical engineers because it was all it was all very hush hush at the time and um, that kind of put me on the books for corporate investigations so I've conducted 17 years of corporate and confidential investigations for the CID, the police, uh, city councils, landlords, uh, businesses, companies, um, you name it. I uh, did that for about 17 years. Um, I opened the scientific establishment of parapsychology back in 1996 and became a scientific-based organization 
in the attempt to rationalise phenomena and document what evidence there was to support it. Uh, and since then, it's, it's been a bit of a roller coaster of different types of cases. Now, we are very specific about the cases that we do take on, as you can well imagine. Uh, we do get requests from all over the world. Um, but we do go through a highly stringent process of trying to authenticate all the sincerity of the witnesses. And prior to us actually uh, conducting any active investigations due to expenses and uh, logistics. Um, and of course, we have a number of them, one of which was, in fact, Mr. Keith Linder, who contacted us from Seattle. And, uh, and that kind of led us into where we are with the book. Uh, we, we did uh, two investigations at the location, and the evidence was overwhelming. Uh, in 33 years, it's the only investigation uh, of, of this magnitude I've ever experienced, to be honest. I mean, I've, I've I've seen a lot of different things in my time, but most of which you usually can find rational explanations. But there was absolutely no no way we could find rational explanations for this particular case. So it's certainly one that stands out for me. Okay. You want, want to give a little background on this case, what was going on before they contacted you? Uh, well, basically, uh, I first became aware of the case prior to Mr. Linda contacting us. Um, it was in the news, in the, in the, on Fox News in the, in the US, and he was claiming the most prolific paranormal disturbances, poltergeist-type disturbances, where objects would be flying around, things would be disappearing, uh, there'd been a number of injuries, um, things had been, uh, incendiary effects were taking place, things were combusting into, into fire. Um, and it was pretty much quite disturbing for himself and his partner. Now, I was when I, saw, I, I looked at the, you know, the, the news, the news clip and the video footage, and to be honest, I wasn't impressed. I thought uh, it was very unusual that a lot of things are happening off camera. Um, there was nothing to tell me that the case was uh, authentic. Nothing really to grab my attention, uh, and I pretty much just left it there. It was only a few weeks later that I started seeing things in the press coming out from the US and heard that the television show Ghost Adventures had apparently been in there and done some filming. I awaited to see the, that particular documentary and what they found. Um, and Keith Linda contacted all the, the Scientific Establishment of Power Psychology direct, which I wasn't expecting because we're in the UK after all. And he informed me that the Ghost Adventures team had gone in, which we were already aware of, and they claimed that there weren't any paranormal disturbances taking place, and they kind of got some bad flack about that. They, they, a lot of people were, were sort of calling them and emailing them, saying that they were fraudsters, um, that uh, they, were, they were hoaxing, uh, and even to the point where, you know, Keith's girlfriend had been accused of witchcraft and all sorts of really horrible nasty things and they really did apparently go through hell with this and and keith he, he was always very straight with us right from the beginning said he wanted some vindication for him it was a matter of getting somebody who is what you might refer to as not a ghostbuster not a ghost hunter from a parapsychological department um who would go in and tell it as it is and we said, well, you know, Keith, it's not really the sort of case that we would normally get involved in, especially because of the amount of media interest there has been. Um, but he was very sincere, and, and, and we had a discussion at SEP about it, and we decided to give him the benefit of the doubt and push him through psychological profiling, So, which is a form of psychoanalysis. We did this. We had to do this visually, of course, you know, because of in visual indicators. And this took place over a period of almost five to six months, which led us to uh, a scoring uh, pointing system, which would indicate should we go to active investigation or not. And he scored an 86% on our registers, which, which meant that we were quite happy that he was being extremely sincere. And it was either one of the two that somebody else was responsible and Keith believed it to be real, or, the, or he was in fact suffering from delusion one of the two. However, uh, further analysis which took place put us into the role of that we didn't consider him to be delusional because of his state of mind and what he was working, how he, his attitude um, to life in general. And we thought, okay, well, he's, you know, he's, he, he may be being authentic about the, the, the sincere 
about the case, about the information, about the details, the things that are happening. And we basically took a leap of faith, to be honest with you. And we decided to head off to Seattle. And that is when we realized that uh, at first we thought we'd probably bitten off a little bit more than we could chew. <laughs> I, I, I don't know that I would consider Ghost Adventures a documentary. Yeah, yeah, well, I know, I know. <laughs> I mean, it's obviously, there's a lot of shows out there like that, though, you know, there's, mm -hmm. um, for entertainment purposes only. And I, I watch them for a bit of a giggle, you know, because it's a shame that, you know, the wrong information is publicised over television. It's very hard to get sincere information out. In fact, some of the information that we were putting out regarding, initially about this particular case, the, 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 we were contacted by the Catholic Church and it's not the first time we've been contacted by the Catholic Church about asking us not to put certain information out because of the information we've obtained hmm. and it wasn't obtained by what you might refer to as a living, a living person and it's a little bit hard to, to sort of digest but that's the only way really I can explain it um, so that we do know that there's a, a pressure to not publicize or not get out into mainstream the most significant information in regarding the possibility of afterlife. Because at the end of the day, we're dealing with a subject that does derive control. You know, people are scared of dying, and that is a form of control to some degree. And, and if we're all quite happy to believe the fact that, well, we've got nothing to worry about, no matter what we do in this life, then, you know, we are you could say our mechanisms to where we have draw a line in the sand and say we don't cross that point might just fly out the window. So we have to be very careful about the information we put out and we have to be doing it in a professional way. The problems for us though, was that we were dealing with, with um, a lot of people that are big fans of these TV shows. And of course um, we did come under some, um, you know, under some flack from the fans, you could say, but we were never we were never there to enter into any battle with any TV shows. We were there to do a job. Keith had asked us to go over, and we were purposely said to Keith, should we find anything that would indicate hoaxing, fraud, anything that we might consider just a little bit dodgy, we will publicize it. We'll publicize the hell out of it. In fact, nobody will, you know, nobody will ever bother reading any of the material about what you put out there. And he continues to do so. Uh, and it, we were surprised at his response. His response was, "Not a problem, guys. Not a problem." And, and we were quite okay. That was that was an interesting response because you didn't seem to be uh, phased at all by that. Um, so we headed off there, and uh, and it was it was quite an amazing case. Okay, um, and the 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 advantage I see with shows like like all these ghost hunting shows and stuff like that is it does make people more comfortable comfortable talking about the subject matter whereas i think prior to them people were a little hesitant they were afraid they get made fun of or whatever and the more these shows proliferate through our society i think even though they may not have a scientific air about them and they are entertainment i do think they make people more comfortable with the subject matter and talking about their own experiences yes i agree with that i mean it's certainly brought you know, the right into the public's consciousness, you know, the, the, the field of the paranormal. No, everybody knows it pretty much now. Uh, and it is viewed upon as a very entertainment type, you know, uh, subject. However, you know, for really for us, it's, it's very mundane. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of hours. It's a lot of documenting. Um, and it's, it, it, it's not just obtaining evidence. It's how we obtain it, bench test it, see if we can replicate it. You know, we're, we're dealing with uh, what we refer to as paranormal mechanics, which is we don't look at the phenomena. We look at what it consists of and we'll try and work out um, the little pieces of the puzzle that make the bigger picture. Uh, and for us, it's very technical work. And uh, But it's a shame, you know, that we, we are constantly battling people um, which use it for entertainment purposes only um, and demonstrate the, the wrong use of equipment, the wrong method of investigation, uh, and in some cases, or in most cases, um, not doing anything to support the, the people, the witnesses, the families, or these traumatic experiences that people have. Um, it does seem to be about documenting and simply that's all. But for us, it's a full package. I mean, we've had people relocated. Um, you know, we've had we've had to do that in the past in some cases. So we're quite, we're, we're, once we're involved, we're, we're, all, we're in for the full hog dependent on what the outcome would be okay all right any thoughts on any of this jenny well i have to say that 
even though I did not witness any of Keith Linder's uh, disturbances, um, I have to say that this was really the reason I wanted to do a book about this. And the reason me and Steve wanted to collaborate on a book about this was because it's really one of the most unusual paranormal cases I've ever heard of. I mean, a large percentage of it was, you know, poltergeist type activity. But then there was also aspects of a of an intelligent haunting as well, which I think was one of the most fascinating aspects of the case for me, because that doesn't usually happen, those two kind of things. So I have to say that even though, you know, I'm generally a skeptic and I'm skeptical of uh, of people's cases if I haven't, you know, seen them personally. I mean, because Steve investigated them and I've seen all his data and I've seen the photos and the video and things like that. I mean, I think this is really kind of an amazing case, really one of the most amazing ones I've ever heard of. Um, do you guys want to get into a little bit of the, the sort of uh, extent of the events that, that Keith was experiencing? Yeah, Jenny can explain. She, she's quite aware of the, uh, the numerous different types of phenomena was happening. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in, uh, interestingly, this actually unlike most uh, poltergeist outbreaks, I would imagine, uh, this actually was quite, went on for quite a long time, um, even before the SEP got involved. Um, I believe Keith Linder had been documenting uh, disturbances for about four years, and he was actually really interested in it. Like, it, it frightened him, I guess, but um, he had actually set up, uh, you know, motion detectors and you know, cameras all around his house to try to catch some of this phenomena happening. And he even started a YouTube channel where he started uploading videos and things like that. And the weird thing is the house is only 10 years old. And it seems like I, I believe that, a, that some of the prior tenants had also experienced some paranormal activity there. And, um, Keith, who moved in with his girlfriend in 2012, they said there was paranormal activity happening pretty much from the first day they arrived. They started hearing coughing and, you know, footsteps and things like that. And, you know, even though a lot of the early manifestations were kind of minor, some of the stuff was pretty spectacular. I mean, they would have objects just kind of appear that didn't belong to them, like in the middle of the floor. It was a book one time and toys and things like that. And, you know, things would catch fire. Uh, I think the the creepiest thing for me was that Keith's uh, home office would often be uh, pretty much completely destroyed. I mean, things would be turned over, chairs would be stacked on top of his desk. There would be weird writing and symbols all over the walls and it does seem, I mean, seeing the pictures of it and seeing the videos of it, it almost seems like beyond belief that a paranormal, you know, energy or force would be responsible for that. But honestly, I can't really see any reason why he would fake that or why he would go to so much trouble and really and destroy his house. Because he spent a lot of money fixing a lot of the things that the <laughs> entity yeah. broke. I mean, he was constantly having to fill holes in the walls and paint over all of these weird symbols and writing that appeared on the walls and things like that. He wasn't having fun with it, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so. Okay. So actually, and, and he seems like, I've talked to him over Skype a few times, and he seems like a really nice guy. And I just, you know, I feel bad for him too, but I just don't see how he could have faked any of that or why he would have even. Yeah, and and the extent of it definitely raises red flags. Like it seems like, okay, this is too much uh, stuff happening yeah. to one guy. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I mean, it was, certainly, it was certainly SCP's ruling that though we would monitor and, and look through and, and note the previous things that had allegedly had taken place prior to SCP involvement that we would only go from the day that once we were there as you know as uh, to see if anything was legitimate or not we couldn't obviously take on board any of the other things that had been priorly reported um, because like I say we, we just didn't have the evidence to support that it was actually authentic however 
um, when you start to witness and experience things um, of a paranormal nature in, in the home, then you quickly surmise that Keith was more than likely not faking anything because I don't think he would have had to, would have needed to, to be honest, because there were certainly things taking place on a regular basis whilst we were there on, on two separate occasions. Hmm. Okay. Um, talk, I, I want to talk to you a little bit about the equipment you use and how you actually use it. Um, use hmm. an EMF reader, meter, which, well, you know, people I are mean, familiar with from ghost hunting shows and such. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we have a multitude of different types of equipment. And to be honest with you, we have 21 rigs. We only took four with us to Seattle. Um, that consisted of six, six cases and four bags. Um, it was an absolute nightmare getting through customs. The, <laughs> the, 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 uh, they accosted us and wanted to go through every piece of equipment and what, what it was for. So that was really very time-consuming. Uh, and we did our best to explain, even though that I think half the guys didn't understand what we were talking about. <laughs> I mean, we, we had hot air anometers. I mean, trying to describe what these things are to the guys, they just, they just didn't have a clue, really. They were just going through the, going through the process. Um, we had hot air anometers. We had a, a range of different EMF meters. Now, EMF meters are devised to be stationary. What we tend to see on television is people walking around all over the place, waving them backwards and forwards. And that kind of defeats the whole object of an EMF reader. Um, we usually place them in situ at a time when there's no, no um, unusual EMF readings on it. Background is okay, background radiation of 0 0.1, 0 0.2 milligrams. Um, and they are set stationary. We have locked off. Uh, we have a multitude of different types of cameras, to be honest, apart from, you know, I mean, we have thermal. Uh, we, which, which is often used. Um, we have uh, the infrared. We have the standard. We have the all the, the, the what we refer to as the the all range, should you say, the, the full spectrum cameras, and the motion detection. Uh, you name it. But um, it was a matter of the. It, it was all these things actually. Surprisingly or not, uh, were suppressing phenomena. Surprisingly, we didn't expect it because the run of the mill normally is is people go in and switch the cameras on to infrared um, and that's usually the biggest thing that we tend to see on television programs however we learned about three four years ago that we tend to get better results out of the infrared um, section so we even though that we initially did go infrared once we were there we decided to change the process of investigation utilizing different equipment we kind of took a technology step forward a bit and one back a bit really by utilizing equipment that is rarely seen on investigations of high tech and also using old standard equipment which is things like your uh, optical laser trip wires and things like that um just to see what sort of different uh, differential of different results that we might have and we did surprisingly get a significant difference in results when changing equipment. So it was no surprise to us that Ghost Adventures went in there and lit up the place with infrared and got very little because we found exactly the same thing. And in fact, if we were only there for four hours, like the Ghost Adventures crew were, um, we probably would have walked away and said there was no evidence as well. But for, luckily for us, we were there in duration of, of the both investigations for over two and a half weeks, um, 24 hours a day. And with the methods of changing the process of investigation, and we got some very significant results. Um, we have uh, magnum magnometers, uh, geomagnetic readers, uh, a multitude. We have, I think we had like 63 or 64 pieces of equipment there. Um, and all we utilize, including the high-gain parabolic microphones, which are in situ, and these really do, will have the capabilities of picking a pin drop up at 30 meters. I mean, mm. when set recording downstairs, you could clearly hear very loud um, any snoring that was going on upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> Even though we did sleep only very little. I mean, I came back from Seattle um, suffering from exhaustion, to be honest with you, I had to I literally had to go to bed for three three days solid, wow. um, because it was a because I've never been in a situation where it was like Christmas to me. You can well imagine after thirty three <laughs> years of people saying, "Oh, don't go in there; it's it's a demon infested cellar," and you go sitting there all night in the damp, in the dark, and nothing happens. You know, it, to 
to me, it's like very mundane. But then all of a sudden, all hell's breaking loose around me. I didn't want to go to sleep, to be honest with you. I spent 33 years imagining this sort of stuff. <laughs> Fair <laughs> and, enough. Yes, you can well imagine. That's why I came back exhausted. Uh, we were literally sleeping for between 20 minutes or two hours a day. And wow. it, did, it did catch up with us in the end. It was exhausting. But we just wanted to accumulate as much information as we possibly can whilst we're there. And that's how we came back with 267 gigabytes of video data and over 5,000 uh, photographs and wow. doc documented recordings. Now, when you, when you go through with an EMF reader, one of the things you're doing is trying to make sure that there are no unusual uh, electromagnetic fields anywhere. What, what is the effect that electromagnetic fields can have on people? Well, it depends on the strength and it depends on the duration. I mean, what we don't want is anything above six milligauss over a duration of an hour because we will start, if, if we're in close proximity, that's say a foot or two, then you can start feeling agitated, uh, the feeling of a, a presence, somebody being there. It can, it can cause headaches, it can cause sickness. There's numerous different things depending on, you know, people act differently under certain circumstances. But EMF in general is, is a bad thing. But the world is full of EMF. EMF is everywhere. We live yeah. in a technological era now, and it's impossible um, to, 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 to not find EMFs throughout our home nowadays. I mean, it can be coming in from outside. You can transient EMF, can, can travel. And, you know, with telephones, mobile phones and equipment, computers and all sorts of things. Now, they, they say that they are shielded to some degree, but they're not. You know, they're not perfectly shielded. No equipment ever is. Right. And, and of course, all equipment can be adversely affected by cross contamination from other equipment. This is another thing that TV shows kind of get wrong. That you don't realise when somebody's on the walkie-talkie in the other room that it's causing a ram pod to go off in the next room. Of course, you don't you don't mention things like that. You know, but um, we know all the tricks of the trade. You know, of getting false false positives. Right. Uh, but we were there to try and determine: is there anything to this? Because well, either way, it was a win-win for us. Because we would have—it was such a big case in America. I mean, it was being classed as America's most controversial paranormal case ever. I mean, for us, it was well. If we if we find it's a hoax, it's a win-win for us anyway. Because we will look good either way. <laughs> right, right. Um, now, what is the rad meter? Uh, the, well, basically, it's a form of EMF. It's uh, it, what it does is it's it lights up. It's a light to sound reaction. So when set in a certain location, um, under no EMF readings, should we say, so in other words, there's no contamination there, you're not getting any hits, then you leave it in situ in a, in a, in a set location where alleged activity is supposed to take place, and you await for um, an EMF which creates a light and a sound. We don't use them be honest with you because they, they, they can be affected by a mobile phone they can be affected by walkie talkies there's about we, re, we registered about 60 different things that can kind of adversely affect it's just very poor equipment to be honest with you we don't we don't even we don't get into that um, what we do use is um, audio spectrographs and um, we use uh, very high sensitive recording um, units different lighting conditions different light meters um, vibration units, um, the EMF meters that we do use, we do a different range, very sensitive ones to, to an oil field, geomagnetic meters, even magnetometers, because even the Earth generates its own magnetic fields and anomalies. And we even checked into the, geo, the geopathic stress of the land, you know, which is the natural geological um, surges of energy that you might have during tremors or um, slight tectonic plate movement and stuff, taking into consideration, you know, not too far from Mount Rainer in Seattle. And uh, it is, a, though it's known as an earthquake zone, mm -hmm. it is uh, only very, very minor. Most people don't even feel it because they're only like 0 0.1 or 0 0.5 on the Richter scale, which is next to nothing. You probably wouldn't even realize there was what happened happening. Um, the, the universities register them, of course. Um, but we, we didn't register any of that whilst we were there. But we certainly caught many other things. But the what I was curious about with the red meter is uh, the effects that some of this stuff can have on people. Uh, you said like radon gas can form this, as well as you know the electromagnetic fields from environmental conditions. What what kind of things will people experience if this stuff is happening in their home? Well, the first thing that people tend to report is an unsteadiness. It's just basically the feeling of being watched, unnerved. Um, you know, feel a bit shuddery. You know, the the, the, the feeling of somebody that there's a presence. That is the first thing. That that's the first thing that tends to get reported. 
the second sort of thing can be um, very bad nightmares over a long duration of time. It can also cause um, uh, sickness in some occasions. It can, co it can cause um, blurring of the eyes. Um, it can cause, even to the point with high amounts of EMF, can cause hallucinatory conditions. You know, but we did a complete sweep of, of the house, not just once. It was done every four hours, every single day, right from beginning to end over a two and a half week period. You know, so we knew exactly the footprint of natural, natural EMF and natural GMF in, in the area. Um, and when we, what was really interesting was we're comp when, we, when we're doing certain things in, in rooms where experiments are taking place, we completely lock off that room. So we know that there's no human agencies that are actually around or even going in that location. And um, we'll set the sensitive equipment up and it'll be monitored. On one such occasion, we had uh, set up in, in Keith's bedroom, actually, in sensitive, very sensitive vibration units. And one was placed on top of the bed, and one was placed on the bed frame, which is wooden, and it was a, it was a large a large king size bed. And we'd done that purposely because Keith had report kept reporting that his bed was vibrating and things like that. So okay, we completely locked off that room. And now, on twenty five minutes later, almost, the there was an alarm, and it was a vibration. We, I knew I knew the sound. It was about one of the vibration detectors. Expecting it to maybe not have moved, but just picked up some very small vibration because these are highly sensitive. I was shocked to unseal the door and go in there and not find the vibration detector where I left it. Not only was it going off, but it was upside down, not on the bed frame anymore, but across the floor, about one and a half foot away from the bed, upside down on the floor. <laughs> now, that's, that's a big giveaway. Now, what was really, really interesting, taking in consideration we're doing sweeps every four hours of EMF and GMF, there was nothing. There was nothing unusual. No, no, not even a 0.1 background radiation reading in in Keith's room under those conditions. As soon as that happened, there was a nine milligauss hit on the EMF in only in the area where this had happened, and it ha and it, it lasted for three hours and forty seven minutes, and then stopped dead. Which was really interesting because it was seems that the it left in the incident had left an EMF footprint behind. And we couldn't rationalise that. We couldn't work out how the hell that happened. But uh, it was directly associated to the anomaly. Now, we don't know if it transitioned from point A to point B and went into alarm state, or it literally manifested from one point to the other, like an airport and an airport. Uh, such things have been reported in poltergeist disturbances. Either way, it was enough to trigger the, the object into alarm state uh, and certainly leave a very unusual and high 9 milligauss EMF footprint behind it. Wow, that's uh, and that's saying you couldn't just that's saying you clearly couldn't fake. Mm. Well, there were lots of things you couldn't clearly fake. I mean, that couldn't be fake. There was nobody in there. It was right. completely locked off. There's cameras on the landing. The only access point to that room. There were no other doors or anything. The, the only access point was that landing to get into the master bedroom, and we had two cameras locked up on the, on there as well. I had a laser trip wire. <laughs> you know, so there's no no human agencies could have got into that room. Part of it being sealed off with special tape. Now you have to you have to you have to break this tape. It's security tape, um, and you can't take this tape off without knowing. You know, it's impossible. It's a special mm -hmm. type of tape we use to seal off doors, and we're very very. Vigorous. We know exactly who was in the building. It was under it was under control all the time. There was no way anybody could have got access into that room, triggered that, and got out. And and, and it was just impossible. It really was. Well, well that was just that was just one of many of the incidents. I mean, if we were just dealing with one incident, we can say okay, it's highly strange. Um, but when we were dealing with multiple multiple incidents all all the time whilst we were there. Right, but what I'm saying, like the electromagnetic field aspect of it, would be near impossible. Is there even a way you could think of that someone could have created something like that? No, the only way to induce a nine milligauss EMF into that is as is high as as the outer shielding of an electrical wire whilst it's on. You know, I mean, that, that's how much it would be. Um, we knew the conditions of the room, the environment, everything was pre-tested before the experiment. Um, the only way to get a nine milligauss in there would be to adverse to actually have put something in there, which is generating an electrical current. But there was there was nothing there. There was there was nothing. It just, just started in, in midair, went down right to exactly right where the actual detector landed, 
Uh, but you move it a foot away and it disappears. It is very, very localized. And EMF isn't usually like that. You know, unless you, you know, not when you, if you're dealing with an electrical current coming from a wire, then yes, it is localized. But when it's in the air, it should be a bit more widespread. And it wasn't. It was very focalized right to the very point where these detectors were adversely affected. Okay. Um, now, he also experienced, uh, well, I'll let Jenny take this one. He also experienced, before you guys got there, a lot of religious artifacts either showing up or being desecrated or whatever. Do you want to talk a little bit about what was happening there? Yeah, that was actually one of the most interesting things that uh, Keith reported before uh, Steve and Don Phillips got there. And I don't think that Keith was previous to this, um, a particularly religious person. Um, but because of the disturbances that had been going on, I guess he had had some priests in there that had done exorcisms. I believe he also had a Native American shaman in there. And I guess some of them advised him that he should start putting some religious icons around the house. I guess, in a way, taking kind of spiritual ownership of the space or what have you. And it turned out that a lot of these religious items that he had were kind of the target of some of the disturbances like he had little angel figurines that would fly around and break um he had crosses like on the walls that would be turned upside down or sometimes the edges of them would be burned um he had a bible collection that he kept on a bookshelf and sometimes uh, those bibles would disappear from the shelves um, one of them disappeared for um, quite a number of months, I believe, and then later turned up in the washing machine in the middle of the rinse cycle. <laughs> um, you know, he only knew it was there, but he heard it bang. He heard it banging around, and he's like, "What's that in there? I didn't put anything in there that would be banging around." And he opened it, and there was a Bible in there, and uh, and a couple of the Bibles turned up burned. Their pages were all burned. Uh, one of them actually turned up on the in the hallway carpet like the i believe the the uh, smoke alarm went off in the middle of the night and keith and tina got up and opened their bedroom door and they found the bible open just on fire in the middle of the floor and this was a bible that had disappeared it had been missing for 14 months i believe and uh it just suddenly appeared on fire uh in in the hallway and uh one was also turned up already burned in his kitchen i believe but and also some of the writing that appeared on the walls seemed uh, demonic in nature. Sometimes there were upside down crosses or 666 or things like that, which seems a little weird. But um, I don't think Keith ever believed that it was a demonic force or anything of that nature, despite all of those things happening. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, I think the very, the very first reference of anything being demonic, because you know it has been termed um, the Washington demonic, you know, the, the demon case, and this and the other, was uh, Ghost Adventures. Title of the episode that we did um, gave reference to uh, a demon house, and that has had, it's got, kind of people got stuck with that, which made made our job a little bit more worse because you know we never found any evidence of anything demonic there. Certainly um, a possible poltergeist investigation across hot intelligent haunting of some, call, some sort, which is unusual as it is. Um, but nothing nothing of that nature, I would have thought. But, um, it was interesting about the Bibles, though, of course. But we, like I say, we don't take anything to heart. You know, We don't just say, yes, okay, we had not believe you about that. We, we put it to the test. We know where the Bibles were left. And um, we, what was interesting that there was no heating or char marks or smoke marks on the wall or on the shelf above where the, uh, there was two shelves and the Bible was placed on the bottom shelf and, and about 19 inches above was the second shelf. But there were no charring, no scorch marks, no burn marks, no smoke uh, around and very little ash, to be honest. It was very, it just seemed to be very localized on top of the actual Bible pages. Now, and it's, no, it's not something that we would normally do, or nor like to do, but we had to test how fast these pages go up with a naked flame. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, we don't ever really want to burn pages in and out of the Bible, but we had to prove something. And what we found is those babies go up like fire. <laughs> they really do. <laughs> you, know, you, you like that, and woof, it's gone. It's like a cigarette paper. 
uh, and it could be because it's the it's the chemicals in the ink and the very thin paper that they use. It just makes it highly inflammable. Um, applying a light, a lit flame to it, completely decimates the whole thing completely. However, what we were seeing from the Bibles and the photography that it was taken at the time, and he, he, he actually still had some of the Bibles, and, we, and he clearly showed us, it, there was evidence of the heat had been applied, but not really a naked flame. You apply a naked flame to this, there's nothing left of the Bible. But definitely, it would seem heat had been applied to it, and not so much a naked flame, and that makes it a little bit more interesting. How the phenomenon, I mean, we've heard about incendiary conditions before it's not the first time things uh, like that have been reported to us uh, in fact i did another case once and uh, you know some years back and there were incendiary effects taking place in a kitchen and a number of things caught fire whilst we were there um, so we do believe it's possible however i think the energies that are involved in such things uh, creates heat like like a form of high high degree of friction but uh, not a living not a live flame should we say and i think from the evidence that we found from the tests carried out and we, we did about three or four tests on different Bibles, is that everything seems to point towards heat being applied and not a, not a naked flame. Well, so this, this brings me to my next question. He had a lot of experiences with things apporting from one area to another, just dis, dis, disappearing, reappearing, even stuff he didn't own. Um, and a lot of times it's reported that, that when, when you have these apportations, the stuff is warm to the touch after it appears. Could that be the explanation of what's happening to the Bibles, uh, either intentionally or unintentionally, by whatever's moving them around, that they're going through a system that's creating enough heat to make it look like they're burning? There is a possibility of molecular manipulation traveling so fast that it generates heat, just like rubbing your hands together. I mean, we, we all rubbed our hands together and felt the, the, how to warm the hand up. But you can imagine if the, if the hand was running, running against each other at 10,000 miles an hour, then they probably would combust. You know, so, I mean, there's always the theory of this. And we've talked about the theories into this molecular manipulation before and regarding the apportation, the asportation uh, phenomena. And that sometimes, yes, they are felt warm to the touch, which might indicate that they deatomized and atomized. And it's the friction of those atoms coming back together that leaves the object warm to the touch. However, it's very little evidence, you know, because it's just these these incidents happen just so randomly. Um, and, and, and most of the occasions, you know, you're not expected, usually unexpected. Sometimes things appear that don't belong. He had a couple of items that turned up, kids' toys. He never had any children. Uh, and neither did the, uh, the neighbours. Um, have any children uh, and they didn't belong to him even a book a book on wine of all things <laughs> turned up on his <laughs> counter one day and uh, and, and he, he, he just he just smiled at himself or you know this is really unusual um some things disappeared from his house um cctv cameras you know there's sometimes a camera will be turned in the morning facing the wall so he'd turn it back and then he'd the following day, he'd come down and it'd be facing the wall again, and he'd turn it back. And this would go on to three, three or four days, and eventually he'd come down one morning expecting the camera to be facing the wall, and it was gone. And he never found it again. That happened at least three or four occasions where cameras just disappeared. Um, and of course, candlesticks and, uh, and other items from around the house would appear, and not only appear, but disappear as well. So there, there was a, um, a con you know, continuous amount of apports and asportations taking place. And there's lots of theories as to where those actually go. Now, we've learned over the years through the paranormal mechanics and the mechanisms of paranormal phenomena that they are very resourceful and do not like to waste energy when these incidents take place. So it's very likely that if a, a, an apport takes place or an asport takes place, in other words, it suddenly disappears, the likelihood is that it's probably very close by. It might be within within the linings of the wall or under the floor, in the roof. I don't think the fact is that these things are being transported to hundreds of miles away and then back again, because I think the energies that are involved are ridiculous. And it would seem that most powerful paranormal phenomena are very resourceful and don't like to waste energy, especially when it comes to incidents, because you always want to make sure that you witness them to cause a vexation cycle. Hmm. Okay. Um, now, he was also experiencing electrical issues. Mm, he did. He had quite a few of those, um, even whilst we were there. Um, I mean, it, it was too so many. Uh, the lighting would sw switch on on and off so fast that you can clearly see that it's not it's not the light switch has been turned. 
on and off. They're just firing on and off so fast that it's without explanation, no idea why that why that would take place. To also take into consideration that his car was having electrical problems. That was a regular thing. Even the cooker blew up while we were there. <laughs> oh yeah, it was a bit crazy. <laughs> Um, now, the, the front door was one of the first things you experienced. Uh, the front door would open on its own, not set the alarm off, and you even had, at, at one point, the part of the alarm voice changed. The circuitry within the alarm, we did check into this because it, it was an alerting alarm. When the front door opens, it would say, front door open, you know, just as it would with the back door. And right. um, it was a, yeah, it was a vocal response. Now, in the programming of that, you can turn it on and off, you can have a silent or you can have it vocal. But within the microchip itself, there is no programming to just change one word or, or delete one word. Uh, and it did change whilst we were there. There was occasions when the front door was open when we didn't hear anything. There was occasions when the front door did open and we did hear it and nobody opened it. There was an occasion when we all left, locked the door, went to the shop, came back 20 minutes later to find the door open and still in its locked position. Hmm. It, we just couldn't fathom it out. I mean, I thought at that time, that was in the second day in, and I thought, somebody must be playing a trick. Somebody's got a key to this house, and somebody's messing about. But then when things start happening whilst you're there, and you start to realize that, well, that's unlikely because there are similar disturbances happening of that nature whilst we were present. Uh, the whole, a whole word disappeared. It, it, just stopped, it just went to say, front door. And that was it. He never said one door open anymore. He <laughs> kept manual and, and literally within the circuitry that would it can't happen. There's no there's no way of doing that. You know, and people have been alerted many times in the house. I mean, the fire brigade have been called out, this monitored by ADT control and the fire service came out and um, and and they attended. There was a, a log on that report when things had been found combusted, and they wrote a, wrote in the report they couldn't find an incendiary condition. They couldn't find a reason why something would burn. They just couldn't find an explanation. So I mean, and they did know that in the in the official documents. Um, those disturbances, the electrical disturbances, were quite common. They were happening quite regularly. Okay. Um... To, uh, explain a little bit about what you you consider transplaced sounds. Oh, this is a theory. This is a well. Do you know we we started off as a theory, should we say? I mean, that it's a it's a form of it's, it's a section of the paranormal mechanics trying to identify um, the phenomena of audible recordings. Now we've all heard and seen so many EVPs on television shows, and to be honest with you, I thought that was the standardised you know EVPs kind of always are a little bit could it be this could it be that they have to be uh, enhanced through specialized software and all sorts of things you know to make it clearer to bring the noise and the hush down and all sorts of things now the scale of audible recordings was like well to, to, to change my life to be honest with you i've never witnessed anything like it ever it was it was just unbelievable apart from having three forms of direct voice phenomena which came straight out the air right next to us, with nobody there, we interrupted our conversation sometimes, was was phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. But the, the recordings were incredible. These weren't like EVPs. We had to come up with a phrase, AVP, like actual voice phenomena, um, and gave us the opportunity to, it was so clear as if someone was stood right next to you. We sent those for, over to a specialist, a world specialist in EVP, and we said, can you listen, have a listen to tell, and, and, and just identify the fact that you can hear what we can hear. And he came back to me and he said, is this an EVP? And I said, yes. He said, well, you can't hear it because there's somebody talking. Is it in the background? I said, no, the person talking is the EVP. <laughs> <laughs> and this is, this, this is a serious scale of it, it was. It, we, there was no, it, it, it became hard for people to believe because they couldn't determine what was EVP and what was a normal voice. We expect EVPs to be of a certain grade, and this was well above. And there was a, they came flying in. We had four over 400, I think it was 420-something different audio recordings. Um, a, whole, a lot of them were classes AVPs, three direct, direct voice phenomena straight out of the air. They had accents. You could clearly make out they were male and female. They were interactive. They were commenting on the equipment we were using. They were always one step ahead. Never let it be said that spirits are dumb. 
be one. <laughs> it's true, though. It's true. People think, think that spirits are dumb, and I don't know why. And I really don't know why. They go into a house and they whisper, you know, let's go and set this up, let's go and do that. And they're probably there listening and watching everything. And in fact, they're very clued up and surprisingly clued up about some of the equipment, even though that some of the terminology is a little bit out there because we had one EDP very clear in bathroom from a gentleman, certainly a gentleman who said image capturing device. And to me, that's the camera of some sort, but, you know, but the terminology is certainly something to be said for. But there was other things said where they were trying to identify the equipment. I mean, we'd be, not only did they invade, because we were trying to document, video document the whole thing as well, just in case we ever put this out as a documentary. And we are going to do a one and a half, one and a half hour documentary on this because we've got an incredible amount of material. But it was a nightmare because they were invading. We had to end up checking the video footage each and every day because they were, the, the, the voices were, were invading the audio of the video recorder. We didn't hear anything at the time. We might be in conversation, and then all of a sudden, another voice comes over, and, and, and as loud as mine uh, and Don's, and there's, no, there's only us there's only two there. And it's a female. There are no females in the environment, neither. And, and they, they were all over it. I mean, every time we did, I mean, we did three takes. To, um, just for an example, we did three takes of one scene where I had to go out the front door and basically come back in. And a very loud voice, a female voice says, on three. You know? <laughs> and when we brought out a Tascam, um, which is a, a recording device, um, it was it's a very unusual piece of equipment. Not everybody uses them, but it's, it's difficult to identify them visually as to what the real purpose is. And when we were setting that up, we got voices coming over very louder than ours saying, it's a camera, it's a camera. Uh, no, it wasn't, it was a task cam, but somebody was, somebody was trying to identify what it was. And, and this is what we ended up, we didn't realise, to be honest with you, until we came back to the UK, what we really had, until we started going through analysis. And when we did, we were just like, oh my God, well, what is all this? And uh, it's been incredible because that led us through to analysing every little bit and then, then we realised the, the amount we really did have. The, the, com the communications were incredible. Now, now, one of the first ones you got mentioned a pillow and there was some significance <laughs> to this. <laughs> well, <laughs> talk about spirits. Don't, all spirits even have fun, you know, and, and, uh, and I think on this occasion this demonstrated it. And when we first arrived on the first day, um, when, when we met Keith, um, the, we were shown to where we were going to be sleeping, even though we didn't sleep in the rooms very often. And uh, Don went up first, and he came down and said, yes, I'm picking the back room, and, uh, the side room. And I said, right, I'll have the, I'll have the back room. And I got in there, and um, there was a, a very, very, very thin pillow in the bed. It must have been probably about one inch thick. I ended up having to sleep, when I was sleeping in that bed, I ended up sleeping with my arm under the pillow because it was so low. And um, I think it was that the following day, there was a number of recordings and a very loud recording came over, just out of the blue, to be honest. And it said, uh, you moved our pillow. I want, you moved our pillow. And Don started grinning. And I said, what the hell is that? And he said, did you hear that? I said, I'll play it back again. And he said, you moved our pillow. I said, what's all that about? And he started giggling. I said, what are you laughing at? He said, well, I've got a confession. I said, what? And when I went upstairs to the bedrooms, I looked at both. I thought, oh, that's okay. And that's okay. But notice that you had two pillows on your bed. And I only had one, so I nicked yours. I, I... <laughs> <laughs> so he pinched my pillow off my bed. And hence, he, he was laughing, thinking that the, the spirits had uh, kind of grasped him up, so to say, you know. <laughs> so we saw the funny side of it. But nevertheless, though, it would seem to be directly associated to the action that happened maybe the day before. Now, now he also started asking, uh, like he had lost his one recorder and asked where it was, and they told him. And then there was the incident with the boot. Well, this was on the second visit because, you know, what we did is we came back and uh, knowing what we'd found there and finding through the, throughout the analysis the amazing thing we captured, we thought, right, okay, when we go back a second time, we really are going to be armed to the teeth. And not only are we going to take higher-grade equipment, but we're also going to take uh, um, somebody who's very renowned in the UK, uh, which was Nick Kyle, and he was the president of the Scottish Society of Psychical Research as an, as a, as an independent observer. 
because at the end of the day, somebody might even turn around to us and say, where does the, where does the line draw? Where does the ball end, should we say? Somebody could turn around and say, well, you're in on it, you know, and then the next person's in on it. So we knew that with Nick's credibility, if he was to witness something, he'll say it as it is. And he did. And he did witness it. And he did say it as it is. And we're glad we took him because, like Nick, Nick, Nick and myself spent a lot of time documenting psychoanalysis. Uh, we both come from a, a, a higher grade paranormal background, parapsychological research. Um, and we've both been involved in, in sort of areas of sociology and counseling and things. So it was great to have him there. It was also great to see his face when he first witnessed it. <laughs> and uh, it, was, it was an absolute picture. But um, it's not something that he, I'm sure he was expecting, even though that I am aware that he has uh, experienced paranormal phenomena before, probably more so. But uh, I don't think he was expecting the level of audible phenomena. And we put that to the test because on one occasion, there was, well, there was two occasions, actually. The first occasion was Don went into his suitcase and pulled out a boot. And he said, where's my other boot? And I said, well, have you had it on? He said, well, no. I said, well, did you pack it? He said, I'm sure I packed it. It's definitely here somewhere. So he's asked, he, 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 he just coincidentally, he just said, let's, let's, where's my recording? Grab the recorder. And I said, guys, can you tell me where my boot is? And we were just smirking at each other ourselves, me and Nick, thinking, you know, he's just having a lark. He, played, he pressed 10 seconds on the recorder and played it back, and we thought it was just going to be funny, a funny event, but it turned quite serious when the response said, it's under your bed. And so we went upstairs and looked under the bed, and it wasn't there. What was all that about? We looked under all the beds in that house, and it wasn't there. Turned out he hadn't even packed it because his, the following day his wife rang to see how he was and she says, you've left a boot under the bed. <laughs> <laughs> and, we, and when we told us that, we just thought, no, we're not, we're not having that. So we said, right, let's put it to a proper test then. you know. Um, and and we, we got the opportunity when Don had lost one of his recorders and he grabbed the, he, he had two recorders with him, specialised recorders, and he, he clicked on the other one for 10 seconds and said, guys, can you tell me where my recorder is? And he said, it's under your bag. And of course, it was under his under his bag. You know, we, we we'd searched the house for two hours, going past this bag, looking around it, but never lifting it up. Um, and it was just surprising to me, surprising to Nick. They were very, very cooperative. Um, <laughs> and so when we realise that we can get responses from these guys, we can set questions. And when we can get set questions, then we can get some very interesting response. Hmm. So I'll, I'll let Jenny uh, take this one. In the research in the house, did you find anything unusual about the previous owners of the house? Well, here was something that I found very interesting. Now, Prior to this neighborhood, the neighborhood, uh, I believe, is called the Timbers, where it's a housing development built about 10 years ago. And where it was built was previously all, like, forest. A lot of trees had to be cleared and stuff like that. But the only place that wasn't forest was exactly where Keith's house is standing now. Evidently, that's the only place in the entire area where there used to be a prior residence. There used to be a cabin there, and it was built in the 1940s. Now, apparently, the people who lived in this cabin, I'm not sure exactly what they did, but they were evidently accused of some crimes and went to prison. So we're really not sure. I mean, we're really not sure if that had something to do with, you know, the subsequent disturbances but it would i mean if it didn't it was a huge huge coincidence and i mean there's also there's also a lot of history of um battles between irish loggers and native americans right around in that area so you know it could be speculated that that might have had something to do with it also but i do think it's very strange that 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 where keith's house stands is the only place that had a prior dwelling on it what do you think about that, Steve? I thought it was really interesting through the research that we did because 
the first thing we wanted to determine is that if it's poltergeist phenomena, then it's usually witness, it's usually witness associated. You know, it's, uh, it's usually those catalysts, focus, whatever you want to call them. They are responsible, more like haunted people. And where they go, they're, they're the phenomena follows. And that wasn't the case because we found out that it was uh, a lady who was the previous owner and she was only there for five months and she got out because of the disturbances. Um, and there was even a tenant even before that who apparently had a, was, a, was a, a subject of a vicious attack in the house. And the person who was also living in the house at that time with her uh, who was responsible for this vicious attack, claimed, and it was documented, claimed that he was seeing voice, uh, hearing voices and seeing shadows. Um, so, because we, we, we wanted to know, Keith had been there for four years in a 10-year-old house. So there's six years remaining. Uh, the first, the, the tenant before was only there for five months. So, you know, we're talking four and a half years, five at most. There's still five years missing. We wanted to know who was the first person in and what the day report. So we did go back and we did find anomalies that indicated that, you know, this is just generally a bad house. You know, I mean, I, I think I think what's happened is, is that we took, we're dealing with an area. We're dealing with a, an infested location and a house has been built over it, like capturing a fly in a glass. Um, and I was quite concerned, obviously, to, to considering the levels of phenomena was increasing because it got to the point where there was manifestations, which are some liquid which was for, coming out of the wall by all intents and purpose, um, and markings of Trinity, and, and then these strange markings that appeared on the walls, even though very corny by pointing six six six, because anybody that's done any proper research in demonological supernatural phenomena we will quickly come to the conclusion that 666 isn't the actual number <laughs> mm -hmm. but it's interesting that it was used um but we weren't interested in the markings so much we were interested in what markings consisted of and we couldn't work it out to be honest with you we we, we conduct over well it was at least over eight weeks of analysis on on these photographs and video alone uh, it was undulating patterns within it. It wasn't, we talked to the, the best professionals we possibly could, artists, decorators, painters. They said they couldn't, they couldn't work out, neither of them could work out the process of application. It wasn't dripped, it wasn't sprayed, it wasn't paint. There was an undulating pattern, there was intelligence to it. The whole markings when zoomed in consisted of fibres and dots, you know, which created the bigger picture. You know, we, we had no idea. In fact, the only thing that ever came close to it was uh, was something that um, myself and Jenny came across, which was uh, horsehair marking, which was something like the Native Americans used to do on pottery many, many years ago, where they'd heat up horsehair to a ridiculous temperature and then basically splash it and touch things with it to create patterns of dots and fibres um, in artwork. And it, it looked very, very similar. Um, but we, we could never find out. No, I mean, the, the, the actual phenomena of the markings only lasted for about a week and a half uh, and quickly stopped uh, after the, the first exorcism or the blessing of the house took place. And that type of phenomena ceased, even though that there was a continued amount of phenomena still taking place. Hmm. This... Uh... I mean, obviously, it shows signs of being a poltergeist phenomenon, but at the same time, it's missing some of the key elements. Um, it definitely has a, a, a trickster nature to it. And do you think some of the, uh, like the religious artifacts and stuff like that, may be a part of that trickster sort of trying to throw people off, or do you think there's any significance behind it? What do you think, Jenny? What do you think to that one? Um, I'm kind of more leaning toward it being. Uh, a more trickster type of thing. Um, mm -hmm. Because I'm, I tend to be more skeptical of quote unquote demonic uh, forces. And I think that a lot of poltergeist activity can kind of mimic demonic forces yes. for yeah, yeah. whatever purpose uh, because it's expected, because it will frighten people. Um, so I kind of think that might be the case uh, here. Although, like we were saying before, I mean, a lot of the poltergeist activity that happened has to kind of also be, you know, tied in with a lot of the, of the things that happened that were more like 
a classic haunting, whereas it seemed like yeah. it seemed like you know there there was communication happening in real time with these yeah. quote unquote entities, if that's what you want to call them. So, like I said, that was one of the things that I found most fascinating about this case. It really can't be placed into any kind of box. I mean, it kind of had a little bit of everything, and it's really, I mean, what caused it? Who has, I have I, no I, idea. <laughs> you know, it, it is one of those cases where we were just ashamed we never got to conclude. Is that It was so hard to conclude. Maybe it's our own doing really maybe that we have put these stringent categories together of hauntings and poltergeists and, and nothing in between and i think we've definitely got an in-between here and um, it, it's a cocktail of all sorts of things that have taken place which would lead to the the land probably being infested by the phenomenon not the house itself but nevertheless though i mean the the, the phenomenon was abundant you know it, it, it we were witness, so we were on a buzz most of the time because we just couldn't believe what we were seeing. It was incredible. I mean, there was, there was on an example, the, we decided to change equipment from the infrared side because we were getting a suppression of phenomena with the infrared. And then we started getting recordings saying, it bothers them, they don't like it. And we would try to clamp down on what they didn't like, and it turned out they didn't like the infrared cameras. So we decided to go back a stage and went to the optical infrared. Now we said we, these things aren't easy to set up. It took about fifteen minutes to set it up on the landing, uh, and it had been very quiet up to that point. This is the second uh, coming into the third day in. We changed. We decided to change the process and shift the way we were investigating with equipment because of that. And this is when we started to get significant results. It was so sudden as well because we'd set this equipment up on the landing. We'd walk downstairs, and I'd just taken my foot off the bottom step when the all went into, well, it went to alarm state. I looked up at Don, he looked at me, and I, and I, and I ran up the stairs. It, not just one step, in twos. I flew up those stairs. You know, because for me, I, fantastic. That's just, that's just, that's gone off. Why has it gone off? We've only just come down the stairs. Everything, it shouldn't go off. What was really interesting, as I'm going up the steps, I hear someone running away across the landing. Small feet, you know, it's as if maybe a child, but nevertheless, I can hear it, and I'm pursuing it. And in the process of it, it set off the second alarm at the other end of the corridor. So it was a scene that maybe it come up, wondering what this, this piece of equipment was, set it off, panicked, ran off, and set the other one off at the other end of the corridor whilst I'm pursuing of course, I, I pursued it all the way into Keith's office and nothing was in there. Um, but I, I just couldn't believe what I was witnessing. It was incredible. Um, there, was, there was lots of things happening. A camera, which is uh, motion detection, which points towards the front door because it was purposely set there to monitor the front door. Um, it pings uh, Keith's laptop if it should capture a motion detection um, picture. It is an alert. And we were, there was only three of us in the house. We were all in the back bed, the back room, which is the downstairs uh, kitchen area. Uh, sat down on the table. Keith's got his laptop there. And all of a sudden, his laptop pinged. And I said, what's that? He said, well, one of the cameras has just pinged me. I said, which one? He said, the front room, where the front door, the one that's pointing towards the front door. I said, really? I went in there with Don and Keith in tow to realize that the camera was no longer facing the door, was facing the wall. And Keith grinned and went, oh, here we go. And I went, what? And he said, this is a regular occurrence. And we start to find out then that, yeah, this has happened a lot. And in some cases, he's kept turning it to the point where the whole thing's disappeared. And that's happened on more than one occasion. So we start. that was really interesting because that happened whilst we were there. Now, what we started to do is look into that, the, the specifics of that camera. Now, we know when it was taken because it alerted us the time it was, it was taken, the photograph. The photograph shows nothing but the wall. And I thought, well, that's interesting, you know, because it's pointing towards the wall on Discovery. It's only taken a photograph of the wall. But then when you realise in the technical specific specifics of that camera, it should have taken a photograph in one of one, one in 125th of a second. So if it transitioned from pointing to the door to the wall, which is 180 degrees, it should have taken a photograph in between the movement. But it didn't. It only took a photograph of the wall, so we don't know if the camera actually did move or it manifested from one place to the other, you know, which has made it even interesting. The fact is that nobody was in there to move it in the first place, and yet we got a timed 
time stamped when it actually happened. So that gave a lot of credence to the reports that Keith said that these things were actually happening. Hmm. Um, one of the things you talk about that I, I, I had no awareness of, uh, you t in talking about some of the stuff falling off walls and stuff, you say that generally you measure it because if something moves, say, a foot, Every, it, it'll be consistent in the in the uh, in the entire event that things would move about the same distance if they're physically moved. Well, we tend to find that in poltergeist cases. Yes, I mean in hauntings when you get in, intelligent hauntings and things are moved, they're just moved randomly. But poltergeists are a little bit different in the way that everything very seems to be very precise in their actions, and they are highly intelligent. It would seem and. It, it was stumbled on many years ago by our organization and we started to see we've done six only six what we've referred to as thorough poltergeist investigations when they have been a poltergeist infestation and they are a rarity dis, despite what you might read or see on the internet because everyone's got a poltergeist these days but um, nevertheless though uh, what we discovered was a, dis, a displacement effect uh, what we've measured is point a to point a to point B of its resting place, an object had been moved, um, we'd have made a habit of, re of recording the distance. Um, and that distance would come up time and time again. And it was really intriguing that we also noted that uh, we didn't really, really ever find any incidents of objects levitating up from the ground. In other words, a, de a defiance of gravity. It would seem that they'd shuffle across, fly off walls, go downwards, sideways, anything but defy gravity. And then we thought, well, you know, these are very resourceful at the end of the day. If they want to move something, why move? Why waste extra energy in moving something which is harder because you've got to defy gravity? You know, so we, we know that we're dealing with very resourceful energy and very intelligent. Uh, and it would seem, you know, with these vexation cycles, that when the witnesses see these things, they get up, they get upset, they get stressed and vexated, and that sometimes is considered to be a focal point of them to draw energy from to create the next piece of phenomena. And so the vicious cycle goes on. Um, and we are there is a pattern, and believe it or not, there is a rule book because they tend to follow the same pattern and the same rules. Those people that have been in the subject long enough and look seriously into not the phenomena, but the mechanics of it, will soon realize that there is a bit of a rule book that's involved. There is a bit of a pattern that, that, that seem to manifest. Uh, and, and this seem to be, you know, the, the very stereotypical poltergeist phenomena. So um, we don't publicize that so much because at the end of the day, we don't want to, you know, if people are going to report things, and sometimes it can be a bit hokey sometimes, we don't want to arm them with the good stuff. <laughs> <You Sure. know? laughs> but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a catch 22 situation because you, at the same time you want to educate people about the phenomenon, and we need to advance it, we need to move on, and we need to find out exactly what we're actually dealing with. Now, in, in this case, did you find the measurements matching up or not? Oh, in this case, we didn't get uh, any apports whilst we were there not for the two and a half week duration. We didn't get a single apport. Mm. Um, um, not not whilst we were there. So it was a shame because we never got the opportunity to do displacement. But we got a multitude of other things. You know, I mean, we we got humidity and temperature uh, alerts. We got um, uh, EMF spikes, which shouldn't have had audible disturbances, uh, visual phenomena. I mean, you know, uh, Keith had witnessed an apparition on a number of occasions. Um, things moving, certainly things moving. That was a that was a regular thing. Even the even lights would be swinging backwards and forwards. Um, it, it, there was so much that we, we were unfortunately we didn't get any. No, not a single apport took place, which was a shame really, because we were desperate to treasure to to try and measure for, for displacement, and uh, we couldn't. We did get um, um, what we might refer to is a trajectory anomaly, which. A, a bowl that was an expensive bowl that Tina, his, Keith's girlfriend, had purchased, um, suddenly came crashing to the floor in the kitchen. And on discovery, it realised that the debris spread was facing towards its resting place, which is unusual because that would mean that the object would have had to have lifted, travelled to the other side of the room, and then come crashing to the floor towards where its resting place was. We could tell by the debris spread that it must have come from an old, an unusual angle, an unnatural trajectory. Um, so 
we consider that the object may have must have well must have moved through you know in trajectory to do so or it manifested in air in a different location come crashing to the ground i mean it's just keith had reported sometimes just things just catching his eye and just flying across the room and burying themselves in the wall you know such as candlesticks and all sorts of things and and that things that had disappeared for a week or two and then suddenly wham just but everything always just missed him never hit him always just missed him you know, because it doesn't want people to leave if it's if, if poltergeist phenomenon is, is utilizing energy. It wants to scare people and just missing them does the trick. Really good. Uh, and Keith was upset. But he do you know what he went to his bedroom each night, he locked that door and he locked himself away from the house, not knowing what he was gonna wake up to the next morning. However, it got to the point where it was started to invade his bedroom, the bed was shaking, he was being poked um through his pillow whilst lying down in the, in his face yeah that's weird uh, and and that was it he contacted me he says i'm out of here man i'm gone <laughs> you know i mean and, 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 do you know what? I, I don't blame the guy because he stuck out for four years he became very intrigued with the photo to the point of obsessive to be honest with you i mean we did tell keith that guy you, listen mate you need to calm down you know because you, you you might burn yourself out just trying to do what we're doing he was trying to monitor it and capture it and work out and this that and the he was absolutely fascinated with it but when it started targeting it that was a whole different ball game and keith actually got on touch with us immediately and said look guys I, I, there's been an increase in phenomena we've got thing we've got these strange markings uh oozing liquid coming from the wall in marks of three around the house uh, I'm being prodded in the face. I'm, my bed's being shaken. I'm not being able to get any sleep. I've got it's difficult for me work. I've got, I'm I'm out of here. I'm leaving. Uh, and we said we understood. And uh, he moved to he moved to a condo uh, a few miles away. And apparently he's uh, he's very happy there. He's not not really having disturbances there. So um, I know you're not really sure what to think of this case, but what are your thoughts on this? Have you encountered cases before where you have a mix of haunting and poltergeist phenomena without an apparent source for the poltergeist phenomena? Uh, as far as we're aware, it's the first one what we've done. It's the first one I've been involved in in 33 years. I didn't know. I thought it was clean cut. And when I went through my teachings many years back, um, it was determined that poltergeist phenomena is, is classed as a separate entity to haunting phenomena because haunting phenomena was thought to be an external phenomena. And poltergeist infestations are an internal uh, psychological, stroke, physiological phenomenon because it's brought on by PK abilities from from children or uh, adolescents, usually more females than males. And this is the process of what we're teaching. But at the end of the day, it's like anything. When we, if you think back in school, what you may have learned and and what might be incorrect now, you know, it's a process. And what we learned that that time was probably correct. However, what we have learned since then is that it was a lot of rubbish. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we, we aren't we aren't in these stringent fields between hauntings and poltergeists. There is the grey areas where we might not find a suitable category because we've just not created one. You know, we have a habit of creating these categories to make it look, make it easier for us, but sometimes it can be overcomplicate the issue. And we like to just write it down and note it as for what it was. It was poltergeist. It was definitely a poltergeist activity, um, but we don't believe it was an infestation in the way, in the sense of brought by on by a focus or a catalyst. Because Keith certainly wasn't, because there were incidents prior to him living there. But we also are dealing with what we could be referred to as a haunting, affected area, affected ground. I mean, there was reference to it being uh, that the houses may have been built over Native American burial grounds. And that's very feasible when we look through the research. Yes, they may have done. And when we actually checked it even further, it was quite alarming because the construction company, which is still at this very moment in time building for other houses, only about four or five miles away from that location in a new area, um, are doing exactly the same. You know, they, it's, it's, it's trees which have been felled and it's land that was once Native American and, and they're digging it up and they're building houses. And should they come across some Native American bones, the process is dealt with very quickly and very responsibly. Um, and it doesn't take very long. I mean, if that happens in the UK, I mean, it's, hand, it's tools down, guys. You're not going to do anything for the next six months. Go home. You know, I mean, but over there, it's, it's, it seems to be a very quick. Uh, yes, it's Native American. Yeah, get it relocated and get back to work. You know, and this seems yeah. to be the process there. 
um, very laid back. And it could be that, yes, we there were uh, it, the house may be built on Native American burial grounds, but we didn't get any evidence in the sense of any audible phenomena being Native American. We got a lot of Irish, funny enough, and I can <laughs> understand why the hell we're getting a lot of Irish. I just couldn't understand. Only through research then that we found that Irish were employed in the thousands to come over and fell those feet and fell those trees and the forests and the woodland uh, to make way for housing development. Only to realise when they get there that there were skirmishes and wars and deaths in the hundreds, if not thousands, of Irish people by by the Native Americans because they lived there. It was their home. We, you know, we were taking it from them. And as far as they're concerned, it was an all-out war. And of course, they were like many other places in America. Unfortunately, they were dealt with quite harshly. And yeah. the land was taken. Housing developments were built. And that seems to be the situation now. I mean, we visited a number of Native American sites whilst we were there, and it was a shame that uh, even on one particular location where there are headstones of Native Americans, they actually are even buried there. They're buried on the other side of the road, but the the headstones are on the opposite side of the road. You know, so there doesn't seem to be much care and responsibility about the process of that. So we thought, okay, could it be Native American? Well, there's a very slim possibility, but yeah, there may be something towards the land. But then Keith's house is the only house on that estate, out of, I think there's 70 odd houses, that it had a pre existing dwelling there. An old log cabin, wood log cabin. And when you start to research that, you find out the two people who used to live there and were in prison for life, which were still trying to file for the information as to what they did, which caused them to have to be in prison for life. But it is intriguing. Do I, you know, we don't really believe in too many coincidences. You know, there may be something to the, to it because maybe just bad incidents that took place there. I, I, we just really don't know. But uh, it would seem that Badland uh, house is built, beautiful, absolutely beautiful house, 283 square feet of it. We know of that by the bad inch because when we investigate a house top to bottom, we really do. We were in the attic loft and uh, we were even in the core space underneath the house. You know, so we went everywhere. And... Uh, <laughs> We, we couldn't find a rational explanation for the events that took place there, but we couldn't exactly also, which is very frustrating, target exactly what was the reason for it. We just we just run out of options, to be honest with you. And that doesn't happen very often, but in this case, it did, because it's something so unsimilar that we'd ever find in the UK. Well, maybe one of the ghosts was creating, uh, you know, poltergeist effects. Possible. <laughs> makes it impossible to determine what the phenomenon is in case it does take <laughs> you know but it makes it very tricky but one thing is for all is that i've never witnessed anything like it in my life i mean i spent 33 years in the field and i was i was gobsmacked to be honest with you i came back in a day state to be honest and that was before i even went through analysis and found out all the audible phenomena i've never heard anything like it and it was it's a real treat to 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 realize that that level of phenomenon does exist it is actually real it is out there it might be extremely rare uh, and even sometimes it might not even get reported but we were i just considered myself lucky to have witnessed it up to that effect in my life because then i have to consider how many people do report the fantastic and we don't give them enough credence you know there's always that possibility right right all right the book, once again, what is the name of the book, Jenny? The House, is, uh, House of Fire and Whispers is the name of the book, House of Fire and Whispers, uh, Investigating the Seattle Demon House. And it's available on Amazon, of course, and it's available print, ebook, and the audiobook is also up. Okay. And where, where can people find you online, Jenny? Um, I'm generally, it's easiest to find me at www.jennyashford.com and that kind of has links to all my stuff. And I also have a blog called goddessofhellfire.com. That's kind of horror movies and other kind of stuff. And I also uh, co-host a podcast called 13 O'Clock Podcast where we kind of talk about weird things, poltergeist, serial killers, anything like that. So we have that going too. Okay, and you have a new Poltergeist book coming up, right? I do. I'm working on one right now. It's probably about two-thirds of the way done. It's kind of like an encyclopedia of Poltergeist, kind of describing a lot of the most famous cases and what parapsychologists think might be causing it and things of that nature. So it's going to be like a big, you know, encyclopedia-type book. Okay, and Steve, where can people find you? Uh, 
<laughs> I get asked this a lot. Most of the time, I just say, just Google Steve Mera. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many different organizations and, and with and establishments. I mean, we run the largest magazine, e-zine in the world, Phenomena Magazine, which is a free download. And that's phenomenamagazine.co.uk. I can be contacted through numerous different outlets. Um, uh, Map It, which is the, uh, if you just put M-A-P-I-T in, uh, into the Google engine, you'll find the Manchester's Association of Paranormal Investigation Training. You don't say that when you've had a drink, of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and there's this SCP and numerous other different things. So um, I, 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 yeah, I'm quite easy to di- discover because, of, like I say, I've been working in the field for such a long time and associated with so many different organisations now that uh, people can contact me quite easily. Um, and if they want to re- ever report something, we're always interested in, in what people report. Um, and, and, of course, we will investigate phenomena thoroughly. And it doesn't really matter where that case comes from, even if it's uh, in this on state side. It doesn't matter. Um, as long as we consider that it has enough credence, support and sincerity to do the case, uh, we, we, we're glad to help. Okay. Um, and the book is, is an excellent read. It's a fascinating case. I uh, highly recommend checking it out. Uh, and I thank both of you for spending some time with us. Thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure. All right, that concludes the interview with Jenny Ashford and Steve Mira about the House of Fire and Whispers investigating the Seattle Demon House. I highly recommend the book. Uh, All three of Jenny's books have been great, and uh, two of them with Steve Mira. And this one really uh, utterly fascinating to me. As I said, I cleaned up the forum, so if you want to make some comments in there about this interview, of course you can always comment on Facebook and YouTube and... uh, we have a Facebook page as well, both a Facebook page for the show and a group as well. 